Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, I'm excited. I've got Dr. Kylie Burton with me today, and we are going to talk about how to interpret your labs. She's got this system that is so cool. So your labs might totally look fine to you. The doctor doesn't call you back. You look at them, there's nothing flagged. Well, Dr. Kylie's going to tell us that there could actually be something wrong and how to be your own little detective to figure these things out. So Dr. Kylie Byrne is a functional medicine specialist who has helped thousands of individuals with seemingly impossible health struggles to find answers, healing, and hope, even if they've been told their labs are normal. Two underlying factor, oh, sorry, no, that, that was it. <laughs> I have to cut that out. That's fine, no worries. Welcome, Dr. Kylie Burton. Yeah, so we're going to talk about labs because so many times women go into the doctors and they are told it's just because you're a mom. Here's an antidepressant. Here's thyroid medication. Um, come back and see us in six months. I mean, try getting more sleep. You know, you're a mom. You have three kids or you just had a baby. That's always, it's always the excuse. You're a mom. Your labs look great. Come back in the future. And then you go home and you're like, Am I going crazy? What is wrong with me? Because I don't have the energy I used to have. Um, my husband's like, uh, where's my wife? And my kids are thinking, mom's got no brain so I can get away with whatever I want to. And in the meantime, mom's stuck because supposedly her labs are normal, right? Yeah. And, and honestly, we want normal labs. If they're not normal, that means you have a disease kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, autoimmune disease, whatever it may be, Hashimoto's. Um, because the way that labs are read is, and the way that doctors are trained to read them, is they take that normal range that you're given on your lab, deemed by the lab, and if you fall outside of that range, now I have a disease I can place over that lab, I have a pill I can give you for the rest of your life to quote, manage symptoms. But if you fall inside that lab range and you still feel like crap, it's not because you're a mom. It's because the way the doctors read them, it's not beneficial to you. You, you don't feel good, but it's not bad enough that you have a, a disease yet. Mm -hmm. So we call it dysfunction, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we're gonna take that normal lab range and we're gonna condense it, make it smaller. And we're gonna call this the ideal lab range or optimal. And if we fall outside that range, now I'm saying, I don't feel good, but not bad enough to have Hashimoto's, Crohn's, Parkinson's, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. When reality is just like, I just don't feel like myself, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. So we're going to dive into not only thyroid labs, but we're going to use all of the labs that you have right now in your own possession. You can go get these labs from your patient portal. Um, in fact, your, pro your doctor probably has given you, you have a hand copy, like these are labs that you already have in your possession. Mm -hmm. yeah. So go grab them as we're going through this and I'll walk you through thyroid and how to fix it. Yes. And so for those of you that are listening to the podcast, you're going to want to watch this whenever you get home or wherever you are. If you can go over to the YouTube channel, I'm going to link to that in the show notes so that you can actually watch the video because it'll make a little bit more sense because she's going to go through my own recent lab work and show you guys what she's talking about. So, um, and I'm, I've got Canadian labs, but some of them are the same. So we'll see kind of what, what shows up here, but she's got her ranges too for the American side of things. So, yeah. And lab ranges are specific to that lab. So yeah. they fluctuate, um, yeah. especially when it comes to thyroid labs. So like, I mean, we'll get into this, but a, a regular thyroid panel with TSH it's usually between 0.5 and, and 5.5. And trying to find your ideal TSH marker in that range, it's like trying to find your favorite restaurant somewhere between um, BC and Quebec. Are those on the other <laughs> sides of the country? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes. 
My geography is bang off. <laughs> You Good job. Say California and New York, but that wasn't going to work where you are. Yeah. Well, what's funny, Kylie, is just before this call here, I had a call with a woman that I'm mentoring in her own business. She's trying to become, you know, more of a hormone coach. And so she said to me, Karen, can you tell me, you know, what am I looking for as far as like optimal levels of estrogen and progesterone in somebody's body? And I'm like, you know what? If you look at a lab, they'll tell you that your estradiol at a certain time of the month, you know, where there's the luteal phase or uh, the follicular phase or the postmenopausal phase, but their range, I, I remember looking at one of them and it was like, if you are between 60 and 2000, you're fine. You're not going to, you're not going to get flagged. And I'm like, that is the largest, widest range. And I said, that is so inaccurate because there is a, you know, we can really condense that down. And there is this kind of more optimal range within a few hundred of each other rather than over a thousand difference. But that's what these labs can show us, which just totally confuses people. It's like, oh, well, I guess all these hot flashes and stuff really aren't because I have low estrogen because my labs say I'm in range. And it's like, well, no. Or I see it in blood sugar. I had a, many clients that are like, oh, my doctor said my blood sugar is fine. And then you look and they're like 0.1 away from being type two diabetic. And the doctor doesn't tell them, just blows yeah. my mind. Yeah, that's uh, when I'm like, well, do you go from a seated position to a standing position and ever get lightheaded? Well, yeah, that's blood sugar. Yep. I've got some blood sugar stuff. That's for sure. <laughs> I've got a healthy blood sugar, but I do have like low blood pressure and a little bit too. of like the hypoglycemia stuff. Like definitely since I changed my diet 10 years ago to a paleo diet, it got way better, but I used to have to pack around um, like snacks in my purse at all times of the day, even though it was a healthy eater, it still, I wasn't eating the right foods and I was packing these little bars and stuff in my purse because God forbid I went more than an hour without eating something because my blood sugar would crash. Mm -hmm. Not healthy. Okay, so we are... Currently, for those listening, we are looking at my most recent labs. I should probably just scroll up so that people can't see my all my <laughs> private information. <laughs> all right. Okay. So we're going to scroll down to your thyroid lab specifically. All right. And if you're listening or watching, go get your labs. Like, have your labs right next to you. That's going to be the easiest way for you to know exactly what you need to do to heal the thyroid. Okay, so we see TSH, and yours is at 0 0.01, when in reality, here's that range, 0.32 to 5.04. And in, in the U.S. and in many labs, it's 0.5 to 5.5, so it's basically the same thing. But ideally, you want to see these labs, that TSH marker, from 1.8 to 3. Um, Karen, can I see on my screen? Perfect. Okay. So let's, let's, before we dive into the labs and the numbers, let's figure out the thyroid. Because here's the thyroid. It's one gland in a system. And if we can get that system running really efficiently, the thyroid's going to run efficiently too. And there's three key pieces inside the system. The first key piece is at the top of the totem pole. We're going to call him H. Are you sharing your screen right now? Yes. Can you okay. Not see it? Nope. Let me just stop my share and then your share should come up. There we go. Okay. Three key pieces inside the system with the top dog being H for hypothalamus. He's going to talk to this guy, P, or pituitary. If you were to draw a line down the center of your head like this, where the lines cross, that's where your pituitary sits. It's this little teeny gland in the center of your head. P talks to T. And the way that he talks to T, or the thyroid, is with this hormone called TSH. What we think of as a thyroid hormone, it's technically a pituitary hormone, not thyroid. 
it just that's how the thyroid gets communication from the body right so we want to see 1.8 to 3 that's the ideal range probably in us and canada mm -hmm. um, and i didn't come up with these numbers these numbers are dr karazian's numbers he's one of those doctors that has way too many letters next to his name He's a freaking genius, and he's the one, he did so much research on the ideal ranges. So they're not mine. I mean, these are just standard across functional medicine. So yours is at 0 0.1, right? Yeah, which I'll mention, I'm on what's called T3-only medication. And when you take T3-only medication, your TSH becomes suppressed, which is what yes. mine's doing. So I've, if a doctor looked at mine, if my doctor saw those, She'd freak out and she'd think, she'd think I was hyperthyroid because it's suppressed. So the higher the TSH is, the more hypothyroid you are, the lower, the more hyperthyroid you are. Yeah, but this awesome. is, I'm very far from being hyper, <laughs> yeah. very, very far from it. But it's because yeah. I'm on T3 only that that TSH and my free T4 are suppressed because I'm taking T3 only. Yeah, and I'll make sense with that in a couple yes. minutes. Okay. okay. So let's say your TSH is low. Let's not worry about the free T3. Your TSH is low. Okay. Why? Well, what's making T or P, sorry, what's making P struggle? Because he's responsible for producing TSH. So it's got to be something wrong with him, with the pituitary. Okay. Two reasons why. This lovely thing called stress, aka the adrenals, and this other lovely thing called inflammation. Okay, now Karen, you're like I am, a mom, a business woman, and you got a lot of patients to take care of. There's only so much that you can remove from the outside stressors of your life that let's look on the inside. So let's look for stressors that are inside your body, the chances are that same stressor is the same cause of the inflammation. Does that make sense? Yes, it does, yeah. Okay. So you're, she's saying, you guys, like when you're looking inside, correct me if I'm wrong, you're looking for maybe an infection or mm -hmm. something that's causing stress on the inside, not necessarily mind stress. It could certainly be that where you're, you're creating your own stress inside your mind because your life and your external life is is too stressful and you're worrying about things and you're stressed out in the mind but you're talking more about what maybe in the body is a stressor yeah uh, yep so we're gonna go inside we're gonna look inside the body and we can figure out if there is an infection that you mentioned using those labs so okay. turn back into your labs. Scroll up to the top with the white blood cell count. So one way, the way to determine if you have an infection or not is with the white blood cell count, WBC. It will be on every lab that anybody has because it's like the number one lab doctors take to just figure out if something's wrong, okay? So white blood cell count, yours is at 4.7. It's in, within the normal range, but not ideal. Ideal would be five to eight. Okay, so we're on that lower end of the ideal range, which tells me that there's an acute infection going on somewhere, low grade. So this isn't something that you're gonna go take an Epstein-Barr virus test for and it's come back positive. It's not going to be an H. pylori, E. coli, Campylobacter, um, parasites, like whatever test it is, it's probably going to come back negative because it's low grade. And when your body's fighting something that's that low grade, it's not going to show up in the labs. But it's going to show up in, I just don't feel like myself. Why do I not have the energy I used to have? Um, that kind of stuff. That's what it appears as. Okay. It appears with people who are trying to get pregnant and have no idea why they're not. Um, when your body's fighting something, it's really hard for it to thrive. Anxiety, depression, 
all correlated back with this infection. In fact, I can find an infection in 90% of people who have anxiety and depression. Wow. Because one, if your body's fighting something, it's just going to give up. Throw its hands up in the air and say, okay, I'm done. And you feel depressed. Or it's going to be so on edge that something just so small can set it off. Anxiety attack. Does and if it's sense? too hot, like if it goes over range, does if that... it's over eight, that would be more of a long-term infection. Oh. Somewhere someone's like, I haven't felt good for eight years. Whereas yours are probably more of a six to 12 month type period in an acute scenario. Interesting. I did just find out that I do have H. pylori, but low end. It wasn't super high. It was towards the bottom of the range, but enough that it was flagged in a GI map test. Yeah. So now it is going to be low in the GI map test. Um, but there you go. There's a type of infection mm -hmm. that would be a bacterial infection with H. pylori um, that you could conquer, and that would relieve the stress and the inflammation going on inside your body, protecting your thyroid. And then the WC, if it, if I do, so if I'm, I'm right now, I'm taking care of it with some stuff. So if I, if it, that was the cause, then when I test my WBC, it'll be hopefully then back to, into that five to eight range. Is that yeah. what I'm looking for? And then I'll know yep. if that's what it was. Yeah. And the thing about this, um, research has it that 90% of us have a virus in us, whether it be Epstein virus, whatever, whatever virus it is. We just have a virus that we're fighting, according to research. And so when that virus gets active a little bit, you're gonna see it in the numbers. Or when it's more dormant, you're not gonna see it in the numbers. So sometimes when I, when I request medical records all the time, I request everything that they have on file, even if it goes 10 years back, because I wanna be able to trace the patterns. And I wanna see, are we in, in and out of this normal range? Because you might have your last blood test that says there's no infection there, but six months ago, previous to that, you would have had an, a more active infection, it just as a matter of how active versus how dormant is it. So it goes along the lines of, I have a flare with my MS, huge with this infection thing. Um, I feel great some days, and there are other days where I just have nothing left in the tank the ebbs and flows of the infection, mm -hmm. okay? Now you can jump down with these, and, and I prefer to have the percentages over the absolute values with this differential part. Um, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, ignore it, ignore it, those words if it doesn't mean anything to you. But you'll find that on your, on your, blood work here and that identifies what type of infection it is and it can get a little bit messy um and I, and I don't find anything jumping out at me specifically for yours the fact that you had a gi map would be the indicator there mm -hmm. what about so, for heavy heavy metals do you see that what, what would that because i also have that and i'm just wondering because i know a lot of people have heavy metals would they show up in the on a blood test not I mean, in the WC, WBC? No, not, no. A, not in not the CBC cons... count. So it's a complete okay. blood cell count, which is what the test we're looking at. I mean, if you were to get a metabolic panel, and that includes markers for liver, markers for kidney, markers for your detox organs, yeah, that's when you can say, okay, we've got a little bit too much. They're, they're having to work too hard. Oh, okay. I do so have my liver enzymes on this, but yeah, okay. Yeah, ALT, AST. I mean, if yeah. you have them, you can scroll down to them. Right there, right? Yeah. When you're low. Yeah, 10 to 26 is ideal. Um, so you're at 16. So that's pretty good then. Yeah, pretty good. But that's a specific liver marker. So it's only going to be off. I mean, I've seen that liver marker AL, ALT in the 200s. And she was 27 years old what? on 15 different medications, just trying to figure out something to help mediate all this craziness that was going on. And then she was taking, you know, 15 supplements to try to survive. 
and she's 27 years old trying to teach chemistry at high school. Wow. Can't even keep food down. It's gaining weight like crazy. It was, it was wow. pretty intense. Okay. So back to this then. Okay. So we, we identified the infection that, and you know it previously as H. pylori, you're on the ball taking care of it. So that will relieve the infection part, the stressor part. Okay. So Karen, scroll back up to the sodium and the potassium markers. Just for your information and for our listeners' information, um, though your numbers look good because they're it's 4.0 to 5 for potassium, sodium it's 135 to 40, 140, but those are specifically markers for adrenals. So if you're worried about adrenal fatigue, you can correlate those sodium and potassium markers on regular blood work with how your adrenals are doing. Now, give and take that because it's really, yes, they definitely correlate with the cortisol, but for me, if I'm talking to a mom and she's like, I'm exhausted at night, but I can't fall asleep. To me, that's a bigger indicator of adrenal fatigue than those numbers, but they're there. So what will it look like if it's high cortisol, what will the sodium potassium do? It doesn't matter if it's high or low, it's okay. just outside that range. So if it's like 133 sodium or 141 sodium and potassium is like 3.9 or 4.7, those would be indicators of adrenals. And then you would perform an adrenal test or just do an adrenal adaptogen, whichever route you take. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's that. So thyroid, exit out of yours and I'll jump back into mine. Okay. Oh, you want to jump back into yours? Yeah. Okay. Is that making sense so far? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. It's so interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. So we got these guys figured out based off of your blood work. That was normal, right? So once we figure out that, automatically TSH is going to feel better. He's going to go up. Okay. Now we have this hormone called T4. And that's where your thyroid comes into play, is your thyroid produces T4. T4 gets converted into T3. That conversion happens in two places, the gut and the liver. So when you're talking about heavy metals or detox system in general, that plays a huge factor on why T3 is low. Mm. My original, when I discovered my, my hypothyroidism, it was missed. It was missed for 10 years. And it, that was because my TSH was always in normal range. And so was my free T4. And they never looked past those two. And it wasn't until a naturopath finally looked at my free T3 and saw that it was way below range. And he said, oh, like you shouldn't even be walking right now. Like that's how bad it is. <laughs> And I was like, okay. And so my- I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy, exactly. I'm not, it's not all in my head. And I think there's a lot of women that they do, they, it does get missed constantly because it's happening in that gut or in that liver, in that conversion, that's the problem. There's right. many types of hypothyroidism, everyone, many types. So it's good yeah. to figure out why. Yeah, so liver, and then you said liver, sorry, and then then you said H. pylori, which would be gut, right? Those are two key factors on where your T4 gets converted. And if they're fighting other things, they're not going to be worried about converting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when it comes to labs, you just hit the nail on the head. TSH is the most common lab marker to get taken, but it's not even the thyroid hormone, technically. It's what's communicating to your thyroid from your pituitary. So when it comes to labs, get five things. Get TSH, free T4, free T3, and then TPO and TG antibodies. You can also do reverse T3, but those are the big five that really get the pieces to your puzzle. These mm -hmm. TPO and TG antibodies will tell us if we actually have to treat the immune system because your immune system is attacking your thyroid and that's the real problem, not your thyroid. Other yeah, people yeah. want to call it Hashimoto's, but it's really an immune system problem. 
Yeah. So it can be an immune problem where your body's attacking the thyroid. It can be a conversion problem, which then that's, if there's a normal TSH, then it's happening in the pituitary, correct? Like there's an issue with the pituitary. Yeah. But if TSH is over range and the antibodies are low, then you're just straight up hypothyroidism. <laughs> yeah. I have to, the funny thing is I've seen hordes and hordes of thyroid labs. Mm -hmm. Very few of them have high TSH. And if they do, it's like 26 or 48. And then you look at the antibodies and it's like, oh, you've got, your thyroid's under attack. No wonder why your TSH is going crazy. And if it fluctuates like that and your doctor is wondering where, what the cause is, if it's going from, you know, 0.8 to 5.7 and 1.2 to 50 or whatever that it is, it's usually because the thyroid is under attack with yeah. Hashimoto's, not a thyroid problem. Right. Yeah. I think that's a really good distinction. Everyone to listen to that, especially if you're somebody that you suspect there's a thyroid problem. But every time your TSH is tested, it comes back normal. In Canada, they have just put in a new regulation last year that says doctors are no longer allowed to test your T4 and your T3. They are only allowed to test TSH. So you have to pay, ask for it and say, I will pay out of pocket in order to have those other labs done. They'll only do it if the TSH comes back abnormal. Then they will be willing to test your free T3 and free T4. So if you suspect it, don't stop at TSH. Don't be like me and go undiagnosed for 10 years trying to figure out what the heck is wrong with your body. So very important because like I she just said, TSH, a lot of, most of her, in her experience, looks normal. Yeah. Yeah, and even in America, like you, Doctors will take TSH if it's good. Hmm, you're fine. See you back in six months when they're missing huge key pieces of the puzzle. And unless you say, no, I want TSH, free T4, free T3, TPO antibodies, TG antibodies. And a lot of times I will get a Facebook message that says, hey, Kylie, I'm getting labs in it. I'm getting labs taken tomorrow. What lab should I ask for? And I send them the list. And then they have the labs when they get them done. They don't even care what their doctor says. They just have the labs faxed straight to me and I talk to them about them. Um, but it's everything from a CBC to a metabolic panel to a lipid panel to the thyroid panel to the vitamin D to the blood sugar. Like I want it all because the more puzzle pieces you can get, the more complete your puzzle is. And now you're not in like Karen's shoes where you're, why do I feel like this? And what's missing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, and so what else do you see as far as what could, like if someone didn't get their free T4 and free T3 and they've just got a TSH, could cholesterol or blood sugar show any sort of, could that be a- uh, Good idea. Um, clipid panels, cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, HDL. If you have a bad lipid panel and your doctor saying you need a statin, or you need to eat more healthy foods, definitely eat more healthy foods, but go deep dive into your thyroid because I have no idea the correlation. I just know it's correlated. Your thyroid and your lipid panel, if I see an ugly lipid panel, like I saw one with a 31 year old, she had like 210 cholesterol and some crazy number with like triglycerides. She's trying to get pregnant. And I see those numbers. She's 27 years old. She's not like, she's not a B. She's, it's not that her arteries are clogging. It's the fact that one, the hormone cascade, as you well know, and two, the thyroid. So we fixed her thyroid. We went, got more labs, lipid panels just fine. But it was a process of what's figuring, what's the stressor in the inside, remove it, heal the gut, pretty much detox the liver and all detox organs, and then you can start to heal the thyroid. Mm -hmm. So when I do a simple thyroid, it's adrenals, pituitary, thyroid, and then take care of all the other stuff. How do you fix the pituitary? What are you doing there? Um, I just have a supplement for pituitary, like a pituitary booster. Which has what in it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
Give us the goods, Dr. Kylie. <laughs> Funny, because I... And then, of course, you got to get rid of the stressor because that's what's dealing with the pituitary. Um, but I actually teach, I just got on earlier today, I teach a thousand practitioners every week on this supplement company's Facebook page. And I teach wow. them the thyroid. I teach them today. We did um, what are on my supplement shelves and why, what I use it, when I use it, how much, and blah, 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 like all the details. And I said, I said to you, I said to him, I said, I don't know jack crap about what's in this stuff. <laughs> all I know is that it works and that's all I care about. So, what are the ingredients in there? So, we got um, RNA, DNA, brain tissue factors, pituitary tissue factors, oh. peach, bark. Rue root, jabberandi leaves, um, L methionine superoxide dismutase. Wow. B6. Hmm. Because I, I, yeah, I've never heard of something to help support the pituitary like yeah. directly like that. Hmm. Okay. But that's a, probably a, a brand that you can only get through a doctor, a professional yes. brand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you have a license, you can get it. No, I can't. No. Yes, you can. You can get. The, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I have. I have other. Like, I've got designs for health. So. Yeah, that's like the same type of thing. Only. Okay. Um, like uh, you, you could get on to. I forget the names of them. But the places that have all of the supplement brands. Oh, the like the online pharmacy for people, yeah. like for practitioners. Yeah. Yeah. What the heck is that called? Script. Something script. Yeah, full script. Full script. Yeah. Full script. <laughs> I do. It. I have a I have an account for full script, but I've never used it. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's like it's not on there. Like this is stuff that you have you have a license that would get it for you. Right, right. There's nutritionists and health coaches on there as well. Ah. Um, as well as doctors. But you, they just want to see that you have some type of licensure and they're not just getting the public using them. Yeah. And so what do you see in your practice as being the most common causes of that, of the thyroid? Like, is there something that you're always seeing? Like, is it, does it seem to always be liver or seem like it's always the gut or an infection? Like, what are you, what's most common? Most common would be the infection. And what but are you seeing as far as infections go? Viruses. Like? In fact, Epstein-Barr virus is the number one cause of Hashimoto's. Like when people feel fine and then all of a sudden they have this onset of Hashimoto's, Epstein-Barr virus is usually the trigger wow. for that autoimmune. Because your body's fine, your thyroid's fine, your immune system's fine, it just has to have a trigger. Right. Something to turn the gene on that says, hey, immune system, go attack my thyroid because that's what my genes told it to do. And I'm under a lot of stress right now because of this infection. And the other component, as you know, is the gluten. Yep. When correlated with the thyroid but yeah the infection is huge and by the time people get to me they've done every detox under the sun and if i were to say hey you got a detox they're just going to turn me out and go bye-bye whereas i can if i can say let's look at the numbers and see what the numbers really say now i've got numbers never lie proof and hey here's an infection then we can jump down and see that it's a viral infection or maybe it's a parasitic infection. Now, when I say, okay, this parasite protocol is gonna take two months, they're down with it because they can see it in the numbers. So you look at these basic labs and you can see, okay, there's definitely either a mild infection like I have, or they've got a serious infection. And then you can, then do you recommend kind of from what you're seeing? you know what, I think this might be a parasite or this might be Epstein-Barr and then you get them to test those things? No, Okay. because the testing sucks. Okay. Parasite testing is pathetic. Um, I've had, I know doctors who are so gung-ho on parasites that they literally say the best parasite test is to find a pulse. And if somebody has a pulse, they have parasites. Yes, I I interviewed Dr. Todd Watts and Dr. J. Davidson. There you go. Those and they, the, say that. <laughs> yeah, they are always there. They're like, I'm like, well, how do you know if you have parasites? 
you have parasites. <laughs> Just that's it. You've got parasites. Whether or not they're causing you problems, we're not sure, but yeah, everybody's got them. I yeah. did do a GI map, which I think if you're going to do one, that would probably be the most. That would be better. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Mine didn't come up with anything, but except for the H. pylori, but yeah, I could. It could. I could still have something. Right. So the way I go off of it is eosinophils, which is a marker on that regular blood work. Oh. So when we're when I say, okay, do I have a virus? Then what is it? I got to jump down to a couple other markers, and they will tell me eosinophils. If they're more than three percent, we're looking at parasites. Oh, if, okay. if I see monocytes at more than seven percent, I'm looking at a virus. Okay, mine are in percents. Were they? No, yours are on absolute values, which I. I don't know the correlation between the absolute values and the percentages. Um, yeah, so like the neutrophils, neutrophils, their job is to fight bacteria. So I would anticipate to see neutrophils high or low based off of the bacterial infection. Lymphocytes, they fight viruses. So they're off. You're going to fight. you got a virus going on. Monocytes. Um, Epstein-Barr virus is also called mono right? for that specific reason. Monocytes, they fight that virus. Um, you won't get a positive Epstein-Barr virus test. And like I said, I don't know the absolute values off the top of my head, but the percentage for monocytes, if it's 12, 13, 14, 15, you would go get that positive Epstein-Barr virus test to the point where you can't even walk up the stairs. But if it's 8 or 9 or 10 percent, we still have some virus being active, too active, causing you some chronic fatigue based off of that. And then the eosinophils is where you get the parasite marker. That's where I base my stuff off of. So point two, I wonder what that is. How, how do you convert that to percentage, I wonder? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because the, the range only goes up to point seven. So yeah. interesting. But, and so in the States, do you guys come, is when you, if you were to go do this lab, would it come back as a percentage? So most, most often they're going to come back as both. Oh, okay. So those that are listening, they, they'll be able to look, yeah. correlate what you're saying to their own labs. Yeah. And it does get, does get a little dicey with the numbers and there's some patterns that go on. Um, so like, it's not always clear cut, but this is where I go in and teach the doctors. You should become a part of that page. I think I should be, yes, because <laughs> I love this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because really, and, um, so like, let's talk about ferritin. You have a 40, 49 right here. And the reason why ferritin and iron is so important is because if your body is, doesn't have enough iron, it doesn't matter what you do. Iron is required to get oxygen to the cells. And if your body's lacking oxygen to the cells, you could have a diagnosis list a mile long, or you could just have a symptom list a mile long. You could try the best supplement in the world. It's not going to help. It might help for the short term. But if you're still, if your body's still struggling to get iron out to the, or oxygen to the cells, then all treatments are going to fail. Ferritin is the iron storage form. So how are your iron stores inside your body? Um, yours would be within the normal range. And I'm pretty sure the optimal range from us is like 110, no, 10 to like 100, 110. Um, so I, I think 50, 49 right there is pretty good. This guy right here, you're actually really high on that B12 spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, I would add in a methylation component for your B vitamin. Usually it's over that. That was actually low. Usually I get flagged as too high. So Are that's you off B vitamins. Am I on any? No. Yeah. So B vitamins. If you do Moore's, it's called a, it's a supplement called Moore's M O R S by the same company, Sustainable Formulas. That is literally feeding your body with what it needs to take B vitamins and turn them into a usable form. The reason why we care is because B vitamins are required for the process of taking our food and converting it into energy. So if you want a little energy booster, 
help your body use those B vitamins more efficiently with a methylation type supplement and probably feel a little bit more energized and your body's going to use those B vitamins better. Does that make sense? Yeah. I see a high B12 on a lot of labs. Yeah. So high, their B12 is there. Their body's not using it very well. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So when you say take a methylation, are you saying take methylated bees? You can, you can do methylated bees and they're popular. Um, I like the Moors better because we have the B vitamins in our food that we're eating. So we might as well help our body use those better. So what's in the Moors then? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Okay. (laughs) I will look it up. I'll look it up. So, but it's something to help methylate your bees, whatever's in there. Ah, Okay. And then for, so you're saying when someone's got low ferritin, which is extremely common in women. Yeah. Especially menstruating women. Especially menstruating women, um, especially hypothyroid women. So you're saying by taking iron supplements, it doesn't usually help. So what helps with that? Iron, yeah, iron supplements. I mean, I had a miscarriage at 20 weeks and I lost so much oh. blood. It was like on the verge of transfusion, no transfusion. They decided no transfusion. Um, so I'm like, I have a nine month old baby and I can't even hold him because I'm so weak. And I thought, you know, I got access to the best stuff, the best supplements. I thought I had a really good iron supplement. And my midwife called me up and she's like, I can get you an iron prescription. I was like, well, how much is in the iron prescription? And it blew the supplement away. I was like, yeah, give me that. So if I were to do iron with my patients, I actually have them go one, take a full iron panel to prove that they need it for their doc- to their doctors. And then two, just go get a prescription. Wow. Okay. Because the prescription is so much better. Getting an iron transfusion, especially if you're going to go through the insurance route, gets a little dicey mm-hmm. and you don't often need that much. Um, but things like, like uh, restless leg syndrome, iron's a big key to that. So when I'm, I have a couple of restless leg syndrome people that I worked in the, with in the past and detox is huge, but at the same time we're detoxing, they're doing iron transfusions with their primary care doc. Wow. And yeah. like in less than six months, they're muscle cramping and weird, weird RLS stuff that's gone. Yeah. So I don't actually carry an iron supplement. I just say, Hey, let's go get the iron panel and then have your doctor give you a prescription for it. I just go right to the, yeah. right if, to the good stuff. If they're like, or they just eat tons of red meat or liver if they like liver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. <laughs> can't either. I'm always like, would you prefer liver? Or would you prefer red meat? Okay. Red meat it is. Mm-hmm. And another thing you had mentioned before we started recording here was I was talking about my blood sugar and how my hemoglobin A1C is in great range, but my fasting glucose in the last few years has changed. And it, and it when, on some mornings, like this is actually pretty good. On some mornings I'm 5.5, 6, which for Americans, that's you know, borderline insulin resistant. So, um, and I got really worried. I was like, oh my gosh, like what's happening to my blood sugar? But then I got my hemoglobin A1C tested, which is an overview of what your blood sugar is doing in like a three month time. And it's in great range. And so you had said that's also an indicator of a thyroid problem. Yeah. And when I'm doing any hormones in general, always fix the blood sugar first or with it. Um, because you know, you got your adrenals, you got the stressor that plays a direct impact on the thyroid and a direct impact on the cortisol is your blood sugar. So, I mean, everything's correlated. If you're, if you're trying to just focus on your thyroid, you're missing a big piece of the puzzle because there's a lot of things bombarding the thyroid. And when I, when I think about this, and I teach people, your thyroid is just trying to swim. He's just trying to swim and keep his head above water. What you're not seeing is what's trying to pull it and sink it underneath the water. Once you remove all those factors that are trying to sink your thyroid, now it can swim just fine and you feel just fine. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. I and I, so I rarely, when it comes to medication, um, I'm pretty notorious for pulling people off their medication. And the way I do it is, okay, 
and we're gonna do this. I map out that exact system pathway I just showed you. So that makes, so when I'm going to say, hey, we gotta fix your gut. How does my gut have anything to do with my thyroid? Um, hey, we gotta fix the liver and the detox organs. Well, how does that affect my thyroid? And when I map all that out, then that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I could say, okay, in six months, I want you to go back to your primary care doctor and get more labs, more thyroid panels, and let's see where you're at. And now we can start adjusting your medication accordingly and wean yourself down and wean yourself off. And then when yours is on the, the T3 and you're telling them you're, you're dead on. So if you're saying, if we're taking T3 here, which is at the bottom of the totem pole, it's basically telling our body, okay, I have enough T3, let's push pause on everything above it, which is why your TSH is low and your free T4 is low because you're basically pushing pause. They call it the negative feedback mechanism. Same thing with estrogen and progesterone and testosterone. When you're taking those creams, you're 34 years old and you have low testosterone, you're taking a pellet. Well, now you're telling your body, hey, I don't need to make testosterone anymore. So let's go shut that pathway down. And then in five years, you got high cholesterol. Yeah, right. Yes, so interesting. Yeah. And I know you're really like, I love everything that you have to say about blood sugar. Um, you guys, Dr. Kylie's got a great podcast that I want you guys to subscribe to. Um, and she has a lot about blood sugar and what that can tell you and how that affects your other hormones. So let's, let's jump into that. Um, cause I know that, that it even has a correlation to hot flashes. Yeah. Yeah. So when I think about hormone chaos, whatever hormone chaos it is, you got to fix always the blood sugar is underlying. It's the underlying cause of all hormone chaos. Okay. One component of it. So if you were to go from a seated to a standing position and you get lightheaded, that would be like when your blood sugar drops a little bit, right? We don't want, we don't want those ebbs and flows going with our blood sugar. We want to keep it steady and maintain it. We're craving sugar. If we are in the, like digging in the pantry late at night, it's all correlating back to blood sugar. And and specifically with hot flashes and menopause, they have actually correlated that it's not entirely low estrogen with hot flashes. It's like the last five years accumulation of your blood sugar. So say you're 40, you're 45, or you're about headed, you're heading into menopause. One of the best things you can do is take care of all systems of the body. So when you do hit menopause, it's cascading very smoothly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Um, blood sugar highly correlates with the cortisol, with the stress. If your stress is high, your blood sugar is going to be high. And if your stress is high, it's going to steal from your progesterone or your estrogen or your testosterone, whichever one it does for you. It's going to be different in the, for everybody. Um, and then when, as soon as your body hits that menopausal stage and it's already dropping, the estrogen's already getting low, now you have a double whammy because you got the blood sugar issue too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And estrogen, even on its own, when it, once it's, when it starts to deplete, you're, you're more susceptible than to insulin resistance because it can help actually with blood sugar estrogen. So yes, double whammy for sure. So stress and I, you know, stress, I always say is the, like, you gotta, besides diet, stress is up there with it, which is you got to correct the stress and you got to fix the diet and that's your two top things to help you to get through the menopause besides replacing, replacing with hormones. <laughs> yeah. The other thing too, like, like we talked about earlier was there's only so much stress on the outside of our, like we can only handle the stressors of life and eliminate them. And if we're lucky, yeah. you can't eliminate anything of 2020. You can, I mean, you're in Canada, you're just all laughing at us down here. No, but, it's bad. It's bad here too. <laughs> Not as bad as it is down there, but it's still stress. <laughs> yeah. You, you can't control any of that. Maybe not turning on the TV, ignoring the news, like getting off social media. Um, but what we can remove for sure are the infections. And those are like 90% of why can I not get better no matter what I've tried? Yeah. Concept. 
Yeah. And I think that we hear so much about self-care and, you know, we need to meditate and we need to de-stress our lives. And I've told now many women that a lot of the time, it's not that it's actually like, yes, that's all very important. And I, I think we need to do those things, but so sometimes it's this infection. And I remember thinking about this with myself, even years ago when I was like, why is my cortisol and DHEA so low? Because I don't, you know, yes, I'm a mother and I'm running a business, but I also am really good at like taking care of myself. I work from home. I'll go have a hot tub here when we're done. Like, you know, like I, I'm not too crazy. I live out on property on a lake. Like my outward stress is pretty, pretty good. And so I couldn't understand. I'm like, why is this so bad. And it was like year after year. And it was finally realizing that there was a hypothyroid and that there was some heavy metals and some other stuff going on. But yeah, it was internal. It was an infection that was causing it. Yeah. I mean, I was just on a, with a lady in France this earlier this morning, we were talking about, you know, our shampoos and conditioners and the makeup that we put on our faces. And like, as a woman, every morning, how many chemicals are we putting on side of, on our body? And when it comes to heavy metals, our heavy metals, they love to hang out in four places and the thyroid is one of them because of the fat content. So they hang out in the thyroid, the adrenals, the liver and the gut. And then you can throw in the brain and the nervous system too. So when it comes to toxins, not only are we bombarded from our environment, but now, like if you look at your deodorant, the number one ingredient is aluminum, mm-hmm. unless you're using a natural deodorant, um, check out, check the makeup, like what you're using the most common, um, even, even cooking oils, like all this stuff that we're getting inside our body, taking a toll on our liver. And guess what? They're hanging out inside our thyroid tissue. That's where they're, that's where they love. And then we can say the same thing with parasites. That's why there's really no good test for it. Because we always think about parasites in the gut. And so we go and take a stool sample and that little teeny piece of stool samples put underneath the microscope. And then they say, oh, well, there's no parasites in that stool sample, so it's negative. Parasites are really, really good at disguising themselves in tissues. That's why yeah. there's very few parasite cleanses or par- whatever you wanna call the parasite purge that actually work. Yeah. yeah. They have to draw them out of the tissues and then kill off generations after generations after generations because they're so good at thriving in any stage that where they're at where they are but they're not just in the gut yeah so many people say well i've had a parasite test or a stool sample done and there was no parasites well that's great i'm not going to believe that that was the final (laughs) result same thing with lyme disease yeah you have a lyme test and it comes back negative that's fine but I'm not going to say that you don't have Lyme disease if you have X, Y, Z and L, M, N, B, O, P too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually diagnosed somebody with a Lyme issue based off of her normal labs and how she felt. She had this yeah. major sign of a bacterial infection and she's got Parkinson's at 45. And I'm, I'm just putting all the puzzle pieces together. And I'm like, wait a second. I think this is actually Lyme that started the Parkinson's. And then I started talking to her about her history and I was just mapping everything out based off of what I saw in the numbers. She's like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, this happened and that happened. And wow, that's why the numbers are so powerful because I can literally predict what happened the last 10 years based off of those labs. Even when you've been told, hey, your labs are normal, it's because you're a mom. Wow. When I interviewed Dr. Todd Watts, he on the video goes through labs of his patients that that have hypothyroidism Mm -hmm. and he goes through different types of hypothyroidism and how they relate to certain parasites. So he's like, so this person here, they've got a parasite because X, Y, Z. And I'm like, what? And goes through all these labs and how they tell him that there's parasites. I thought that is so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I need to get on that cell for cell core education stuff. Yeah. They're, they're great. I want to have them back on the podcast. They were on my advanced thyroid summit. So they both, he, um, Dr. J. Davids talked about Lyme disease and the, the thyroid and how it affects that. And then 
Dr. Watts talked about parasites. So yeah, super interesting. And I really like their product. Like I think if you're going to try and kill a parasite, that's the, that's the product to go with micro formulas. Mm -hmm. It's intense. It is. <laughs> it is intense. Yeah. If, if you do the major parasites going on, I ship them off to my Same. mentor. Like, hey, go, uh, go figure out the cell core thing with him because he's an expert at it. Like, and, and people will post these crazy pictures of parasites coming out of their body. And I'm just like, oh, oh I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both of them have those stories too. They both had a load of parasites that they have pictures of that came out of their body. And I just think, oh, nasty. <laughs> Yeah. but it's it's common it's extremely common and i think that when you're running around trying to like you said going from doctor to doctor trying to figure out what is wrong with me and the labs keep coming back normal but you're like but i'm tired but i've got this little you know skin rash or i've got whatever it is these little tiny things that you that maybe aren't even really big I see a lot of that, like all these just little symptoms, like I've got head fog, I've got a little bit of a rash sometimes, my butt, my stomach gets a little bloated, I just not very energetic, I get a little bit of anxiety. I just think like, don't settle for that. Yeah. Dig deeper. Yeah, it's your body sending you messages, track them down. And, and it's really hard. I, I did a podcast the other day on, um, are you shutting up the message? Like, I can't remember what I called it. Anyways, but it's all about, are you shutting the messages down or are you listening? Right, yeah. And because people are, I had a lady with endometriosis and she literally went and got her a nerve, nerve, they basically just turned her nerve off. Oh, like a so cauterized it kind of thing? Yeah, so she can't feel her pain. I'm like, uh, uh, your body is trying to tell you something and you're going to tell it to shut up literally like forever. Yeah. Cause you say there's a big, uh, liver endometriosis connection, right? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Nice. And I found autoimmune component with endometriosis a lot too. Yeah. Right. So I introduced her to the podcast episode on endometriosis. And the funny thing is that she messaged me a couple of days ago. I was like, okay, you've convinced me. Like let's figure <laughs> out what, what the problem is and let's fix it. Cause like she's, early thirties and still wants to have kids if that's possible for her. But right now, like, it's just like, I, I can't live in this pain. So they've done what they could with the Western medicine route. And then, you know, she's always, she's tired of everybody saying, Hey, try this and try that. And Hey, this oil works for that. And, and I think I had my endometriosis cured from this and she's just tired of it. Yeah. So the yeah. fact that I could say, listen, here's your numbers. Here's what your numbers say. Let's tackle it off of what your body's telling you, not what so and so else, somebody else tried and had success with. What is your need? What does your body want? So with endometriosis, it's, it's a factor of one, um, liver with the high estrogen levels, two, oftentimes a candida overgrowth with it, and then three, is there actually an autoimmune component? Mm -hmm. And I can tell if there's an autoimmune component based off of the patterns inside the labs and fungal. And, and so we always, if you like, say, if you're listening to this and you have a very heavy, painful periods right now, and you're on day five of your cycle and you would love it for that next period to not suck so bad, start with the liver, remove, here's my, my three steps of starting to heal endometriosis. And it's all based off of the liver. And the reason why is because estrogen has to go into your liver, hangs out there for a little bit. If it gets broken down and eliminated, great. That's what it should be doing. If it, the liver is too busy doing other things, it goes back into the bloodstream. And now your estrogen just keeps getting higher and higher and higher. Your periods suck even worse and worse. And the endometriosis tissue in your body's growing, causing pain because that estrogen level is just getting higher and higher. And your gynecologist says, okay, you have two options birth control, hysterectomy, which one would you like? Well, you want to have kids, so hysterectomy is not an option. Birth control, they give you a birth control with estrogen in it, and life is worse. Yeah. <laughs> right? Or Lupron, that's what I got offered, which puts, you, in, it puts you into menopause. 
Really? Yeah. And I was offered that at the age of 26, I think I was. Holy smokes. I know. Yeah. I, I was know. like, ah, no thanks. <laughs> you could have hot flashes, weight gain, but the list went on and on. I was, and this is from a you know, specialist in the city. I had to travel to see them and they did surgery on the endo. Oh. And then they said, this is what your option is. You can go on Lupron and put yourself into early menopause for like a temporary, they could pull you out. But I was like, yeah, no, not going to happen. Yeah. I was swore I should call myself an endometriosis specialist because I know more about it than they do. Clearly. Um, so okay, liver. So, liver, three steps. One, is all those shampoos, conditioners, makeup, cooking oils, like pick the most three, the most, the three things that you use most, make sure it's a natural product. So you're just reducing your toxic load. Number two, check your diet. Do you need to do an anti-inflammatory diet to just relieve the burden on the GI tract? Gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, sugar-free, that's mine. I keep it simple. Um, and then the fourth one or the third step would be liver detox, not a cleanse. There's a difference between a liver cleanse and a liver detox. A cleanse is like, Hey, I'm going to juice everything for three days. And that's great. You're going to basically reboot the system and flush your GI tract out, but you're not replenishing the liver with any of the components it needs to detox things like glutathione. So that would be the three steps on making your period easier the next time. Do you think that they sh women should stay on the liver support stuff like milk thistle and dandelion artichoke, almethionine, um, whatever, all the other, you know, choline, like should a woman that struggles with that kind of thing, should she continuously stay on that kind of stuff? Like N-acetylcysteine, glutathione? You know more about the ingredients than I do. All I say is, hey, you need this. I don't know what's in it, but you need this. I'm just, I'm in the middle of a liver cleanse myself right now because I'm doing it with my group. So <laughs> I'm, it's fresh in my brain. <laughs> hey, well, I, I have a liver detox. It's a three month phase. Um, this is why you need to get in systemic because they have this detox too. Systemic formulas, um, prep body brain phase. So prep phase is preparing your liver, your detox organs for toxin removal. Body phase is going to remove the toxins from your thyroid, your liver, your adrenals, and your gut. And then brain phase removes the toxins from your nervous system and your brain. Well, I find that when people do that, that's so powerful that they only need to take the liver detox stuff as needed in the future. Wow. That's amazing. Can we link oh. to that? Do you have a shop? Yeah, I do. DrPallyBurton.com oh. backslash store. Everything's there. I even have an endometriosis kit. Yeah. Well, there we go. Awesome. There you go, yeah, you guys. Yeah, I'm going to link to the shop in the show notes. <laughs> now that I always forget. I don't, I'm not a salesperson. I, I know. Me neither. I've got a shop too, and I never talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so like, oh, yeah, that. I've got a shop. <laughs> the other factors is once you take care of the liver, now you got to figure out if there's the candida overgrowth and if you got to cut back the sugar for a while, and then there's, if there's a really an autoimmune component. And mm -hmm. I had a podcast episode, I think it's 23. Um, she was, has a similar story to you, only she opted for the hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. And I think she was 32 years old and she was basically, okay, do I prepare? Like, do I leave myself a chance to create life? Where I do I give myself a life? Wow. So her period was so miserable. It'd been that way for like 10 years. Like she'd lost a marriage already over it um, due to the infertility. And finally the doctor said, okay, we can you know, we can do a hysterectomy. So they go in and they do the hysterectomy that was supposed to be 45 minutes long. Two and a half hours later, she gets out. And you know how you can't leave the hospital till you pee? She yeah. can't pee. Oh my gosh. The surgeon removed a nerve. No. At all. Oh. So she's 34 years old and has to use a catheter every time she wants to go to the bathroom. Oh my God. Well, hysterectomies. 
Like, come on. The old, those are the most overdone procedures. I mean, on a daily basis, I talk to women, oh yeah, I've had a hysterectomy. I've had a hysterectomy. And I say, why? Fibroids, heavy bleeding and when they're in their forties. And I'm like, you know what? If you had just been told to use a little progesterone, you probably would never have had that hysterectomy. Like it just blows my mind. I heard these two doctors talking on a podcast, male doctors, which so I was very impressed. And the one doctor was like, they were talking about the overuse of hysterectomies and they were um, bioidentical doctors. So they used lots of hormone replacement. And he said, you know, what if this was a man's problem? He's like, could you imagine, do you think for one second that we would be performing as many hysterectomies on, you know, that we do on women? Imagine, would we ever do something like that to the man? That every little problem he had down below, we'd say, well, let's just cut your balls off. It'll be fine. We're just going to cut your balls off. Everything's going to go to normal. Would never happen. And yet. It's so common in women. It's so common. It's their, we'll it's their it solution to everything. Let's just take it out. We'll just take it out. Your gall water, you don't need it. Let's just take it yeah, out. That too. The call, oh, it drives me crazy. It drives me I crazy. I had one. She, she tested positive for the gene stomach cancer. So they took So she has a positive gene for the stomach cancer. So she removes her stomach. Oh, it's not important. My. You don't yeah. need it. Better yet, she went and had her daughter tested, and they removed her daughter's stomach too. No. Well, it's same with women getting the, rid of their breasts because they have the gene, and I'm like, oh, yeah. don't, don't do that. Huh? Anyways, yeah. okay. Well, <laughs> okay. So, Dr. Kylie, tell everybody about your new membership program because I think it's fabulous, um, and your podcast, so everybody okay. knows what you have. First off. The, the easy one is, hey, let's go learn more um, on the podcast at Beyond the Diagnosis with Dr. Kylie. It's all about, I could give jack crap about what your diagnosis is because usually it's just saying, oh, you have these symptoms. That's all it really tells us is that you have XYZ symptoms. It doesn't tell us anything about the why. So think about it, chronic fatigue syndrome. You already knew you had chronic fatigue. You don't need a label to tell you that. IBS, <laughs> IBS, fibromyalgia, yeah, um, all of it. Like, yeah, okay, I have joint pain, I can't sleep, and what's the third one? Was fibro fatigue. Like, we know that. What we want to know is we want to know the why, and I teach you the why on the podcast. It's like the endometriosis. We dive into, hey, is it liver? Like, do we need to do the liver, the candida, the autoimmune? Hey, let's go find out your labs, bring out your lab, let's see. Then we take it a step farther and inside the membership of the Healing Beyond the Diagnosis tribe. So I'm all about beyond the diagnosis because that's what I'm going to run with. Healing Beyond the Diagnosis tribe is where I'm going to teach you in a very simplistic way that how to take your labs, what we just did here, your thyroid panel, your regular blood work and say, okay, my doctor says they're normal, but I know they're not ideal. So I'm gonna look at this marker, the WBC. Do I have an infection? Yes. Okay, then I'm gonna jump down to this marker and see, is it bacterial, viral, parasitic? Um, what type of infection is it? Now that I know what type of infection it is, I'm gonna give you the protocol that I use with patients to treat it. So it's literally, you have everything you need to walk yourself from however you feel like feel like now to being yourself again in six, nine, 12 months, however the long the process is. That's all there automatically. And then you're like, what if I need your help? Well, I'm there too. Yeah. So you can schedule a mini one-on-one -on -one session with me anytime you need it. Um, if you're like, I don't know what to do with these labs. Can you just read them for me and tell me what to do? I'll do that too. Um, and then we're gonna have remarkable people like Karen joining us every week. So mon the first Monday of the month, we're doing Monday mindset calls with a mindset coach. Um, that's starting in February 1st with a call all about how to take stress and convert it into something useful so you can be successful. Um, Tuesdays are group Q and A's with me. So the second Tuesday of the month, 
The third Wednesday of the month is What to Eat Wednesday, where Karen's coming in on February for that. And then the fourth month, fourth week of the month will be expert sessions. So I'm very good at what I do. I'm not an expert in, it, in everything. So we'll bring in other people. And I know in February, we're actually gonna go on a field trip to systemic formulas. And we're gonna go into their laboratory on how their supplements are created and made and processed and, and deemed clean, like their purification standards. It's one of the best top-notch labs in the country. It just happens to be about 10 miles from my house. Um, so we're gonna go on a field trip over there and see what a good quality supplement is and how it's made. And yeah, that's all in one low monthly fee because my goal is to help more people at a very financially friendly cost. Oh, I love it. I, you know, I was just thinking this morning that my mission is just to, to educate women because they're, they're, they keep going to their medical doctors or to, you know, online to try and find the, the solutions. And it's like, if we just need more people like you and myself, that is just going to educate women to help them to figure it out for themselves. Like this is what you look for when you're looking at your labs, like the, how yeah. amazing is that? Like what a tool the tools that they need. Yeah. So they don't have to rely on Google MD. Yeah. Because Google is great for really, for other things, but not for figuring out what's wrong with your health. No. I had one mom, she, her husband banned her from using Google. <laughs> she was like coming up with all these crazy things about her, her diagnosing herself with all these crazy stuff. So her husband was like, you're not allowed to be on the internet, let alone Google. It's making her go wacko. And I, I couldn't quite convince her about her lab thing. So I had her go to the podcast where she could learn more. It's really about what is, what is it really, the, the functional medicine, when it's done right, it can be powerful. Um, but you have these people who claim that they're functional medicine. They've been to a weekend seminar and they're like, hey, I can fix this. And I'm just going to do the elimination diet with everybody. Right. Like you tell a 17-year-old boy that he has depression because he's eating gluten and dairy and soy. And he can't go with his friends to win these on Friday night because that food is there. You're, you're not going to fix the depression based off of that. Sorry. No. So I go in and I find, oh, well, there's a vir virus you're fighting. Let's clear the virus. Well, hey, go have fun at Wendy's Friday night. Uh, I don't yeah. care what you eat. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm a realist and I'm, you are. so you just have to find the right person for you who actually knows what they're doing at a very detailed level and then jump in and say, okay, I'm tired of relying on Google for my medical advice. Let's actually go from where I am right now to where I think I want to be in six months, but I'm going to be very different because I don't even know what I'm going to feel like in six months. I just think I want to be there. It's just like when you're working with, like you're a mentor. I mentor um, some nurse practitioners too, and I've been mentored by, by my current mentor. And he had me write out like my ideal day. And I was like, I want to have a brick and mortar practice where moms can come in and have this daycare and they just leave their kids and they focus on their treatment and I want, I want to work like three days a week and be able to have the kids, all those kiddos and everything. Yeah. You know what I'm doing right now? Um, it's all online. I work three days a week. And I mean, I had my baby with me for the last eight months sitting in my lap while I'm working. And it's just like this. I had no idea you could even run a virtual clinic. And then yeah. um, in March, we're going to do boot camps. So we're going to do a PCOS boot camp a thyroid boot camp, an endometriosis boot camp, um, a chronic fatigue boot camp called It's Not Because You're a Mom. And then the last boot camp is anxiety and depression. Oh, so wow. I'm gonna be running boot camps. I didn't know that was even possible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be running like six week group programs and membership and a membership opportunity where people can have access to everything they need and no longer a ten thousand dollar price. All Amazing. from the basement in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't even know that was possible until he said to me, he's like, well, what are you going to do when you have a kid shut down your practice for three months? Well, no, I can't do that. What about this? 
Wow. So when you get somebody like you or I, and they really dive in deep to your health and to figure out, um, is it the dairy you're eating? It's like, what is it? And it's usually more than one. Remove the food sensitivities, remove the triggers, heal the gut, do the whole, do the whole process, balance the hormones, detox, do it all. Then it's like, whoa, I didn't know I feel like this. Yeah. My yeah. kids, like, they better watch out because mom's brain is on fire. And they're not going to, she's going to remember everything. Yeah, exactly. The, husband, yeah. the husband's like, I don't care what you're doing. Just keep doing it because I got your back. Right. Yeah. And I think most women are in that place where they they gave up on that so long ago. They think that that's not even possible to feel yeah. that way, or they don't even realize, like I was talking to a woman recently and she's like, I think I feel good, you know? And I'm like, I don't think you do. <laughs> like, look at all that's happening to you. And I'm I start listing all these things. And she's like, oh yeah, maybe not. And I'm like, we get so used to it. So numb. And it's uh -huh. like, no, you can feel so much better it's like yeah. telling the woman that you know with fibromyalgia like well I guess I should go I should start working out should I start working out and I'm like no wait because you're gonna feel like working out soon and sure enough you get to the bottom of it they feel like working out and they, it's not this you have to yeah and the other problem is, is they're just so tired of being told that they're normal yeah yeah and why why do I feel like this if I'm normal and they just and they start beating themselves up in the head fatty and depression and the list goes on and gone and then their then their best friend is trying doTERRA oils which is what the popular thing is in Utah um or they're you know trying some other supplement they found when they search for Google and and the thing is is like I don't throw darts at symptoms I have people that come and I have this questionnaire they're they're ranging from anywhere from 30 to 280 and I'm like if you got hundred if your symptoms add up to 180 on this questionnaire and if I just start throwing darts at each at each symptom with a specific supplement you're gonna be eating a pill after pill after pill after pill and really not getting anywhere yeah yeah because we're just throwing darts at, at, at supplements whereas or at symptoms whereas if we determine okay like for example I had a lady with um basically she had a frozen shoulder she woke up one morning, couldn't move her shoulder, and then all of a sudden, all the joints started hurting. And they kept putting cortisone shots in her shoulder, oh. thinking that cortisone shots, like thinking that the problem was lying in her shoulder. And if you step back and if you say, I have a whole lot going on, my body's just falling apart, then you got to think more systemic. And with her, it's like she has all these joint problems. Well, if, why are they attacking one joint then if your knees hurt too? Mm -hmm. And she had major skyrocket high numbers, the highest I've ever seen for a bacterial infection. And I said, what did your doctor say when he handed you these labs? And he's like, she said, oh, well, he told me that my right blood cell count was fine, was high, but he didn't know why. So, you know, good luck with my cortisone shots thing, thing stuff. I was like, well, what if we get rid of this bacterial infection? And now a month later, she's got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and she's a mom again. Wow. With, with no medications, it was just get rid of this infection that was destroying her joints. Crazy. So if you're not, if you're like tired of throwing darts at everything or tired of somebody else throwing darts at you, like let's really dive in and let's figure out the numbers and then walk you through step by step the healing process, the healing journey, and who knows where you'll be in 12 months. Yeah, exactly. And then you don't have to rely on Google all the time. You don't have to keep throwing deductible after copay after copay, reaching your maximum. If I mean, I, mean, I guess Canada is different than the U.S., but like my out of pocket would be like seven thousand dollars if I were to walk down that line. Yeah. Whereas yeah. I can say, well, for ninety nine bucks a month, I can do that. Yeah. I'm already doing it, and more, and I haven't gotten anywhere. Yeah. Exactly. So that's drkylieburton.com. Go check it out. And beyond the healing beyond the diagnosis. Yes. Healing beyond the diagnosis. I know I'm going to go download some more. I've already listened to quite a few of your podcasts and I really like them. So we're always, we're yeah, on the same page. <laughs> I've had a lot of questions about the, um, why can't I lose weight? The one that you and I just did. So. Oh, so, what, so maybe we'll have to do a Q and A. Yeah. Or a Q and A <laughs> or a part two or. Yeah. On the 
I was going to say we should, because I, I can imagine that you and I could do a number of podcasts together. <laughs> yeah. So yes, for sure. Well, thank you so much for your time. I loved it. You've taught me so many things today. So pff, amazing. And I know you've taught the listeners too. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Yep. Thanks for having me.